Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us today. So my name is Mikko, and I hunt hackers. That's my job. I've been hunting hackers for the last 25 years or more. And during those times, I've seen things you wouldn't believe. I've seen online crime become a, uh, an everyday occurrence. Organized crime making millions with banking trojans and ransomware. I've seen intelligence agencies use attacks to do surveillance and to do targeted espionage. And I've seen militaries enter this domain as well. And the fact is that we have just lived through a revolution. That's the internet revolution. Now, we all know this. We all know internet just happened. You know, 25 years ago we didn't have it and now we have it. But that's a huge shift when you think about it. I mean, when there will be history books written about this time, let's say 100 years in the future, when they write about our time, the early 2000s, number one thing they will mention is that this is the time when the mankind got online. And we are now just about to start the next revolution, which is the IoT revolution, the revolution of connected devices. So, so far, it's been computers going online. From now on, it's going to be everything else going online. And this has already started. And the IoT revolution will bring us benefits, it will bring us problems as well. Just like the internet itself brought us benefits and problems. Before the internet, you didn't have to worry about criminals who were living far away from you. After the internet, you do. The most likely place for any of us to become a victim of a crime is no longer the real world. It's more likely you will be hit by online crime than real world crime. Because on the internet, there is no geography. There are no borders. There are no distances. And as things, devices go online, this will, these problems will enter new domains. And for that, we can blame him. Let's blame this guy. This is Gordon Moore of Intel fame, father of the infamous Moore's Law. Moore's Law, which states that computing power roughly doubles every 18 months. And that law has more or less been true for the last 40 years. And I'm not speaking about the Moore's Law here. I'm speaking about the reverse of Moore's Law, which is the price of existing computing power halves every 18 months. Which means after a couple of years, everything becomes almost free. Including chipsets like this. This is the thing that you put into a device to turn the device from a dumb device to a smart device. This is the IoT chipset that you, for example, put in a washing machine and then it's an IoT washing machine. And the prices of these are plummeting, which means we see more and more smart devices. And I am the father of the Hyppönen law, which says that if something is described to you as smart, what you should be hearing is vulnerable. So, here's a smart phone, vulnerable phone. Here's a smart watch, vulnerable watch. Smart car, smart city. Smart grid. You get my point. And of course, that's a bit pessimistic view, because of course, like I told you, we do get benefits from IoT as well. But right now, many of the benefits we see from IoT seem pretty small. I mean, when people look at IoT devices like an IoT washing machine, yeah, it's nice that you get a notification to your phone that the clothes are clean, but it's not really that useful. And this has led to a typical reaction, which I get when I show some vulnerabilities we've found in IoT devices is that people tell me that, you know, they don't like IoT. They're not going to play part in this revolution. They will not buy IoT appliances to their home. And what I tell them is that tough luck. That won't work. You won't be able to do that. Because very quickly, very soon, in a couple of years, any appliance you buy will be an IoT appliance, and you will not even know it's going to, it's, it, it is an IoT appliance. 
because prices of these are plummeting. Eventually, these will cost, these chipsets will cost five cents or pennies, two pennies, one penny, half a penny. And when they are cheap enough, vendors will start putting them into every device. Even if the consumer doesn't need the connectivity, the appliance maker wants these devices online because they want to collect data. Why? Because they've gone to a Gartner briefing where they've been told <laughs> that data is the new oil. <laughs> they want to collect data because it's the new oil. So, this means this chip will go into every toaster. And our toasters don't need internet. Like, you don't need a pop-up notification on your phone that the toast is done. You don't. But the toaster maker wants to know where their devices are, where, where our customers are. How do they use our devices? How often do they toast bread? What kind of bread? How often do we have failures? Do we have more customers on the east side of London or west side of London? If we have more customers on the west side, let's advertise more on the east side. This is valuable information. They want to collect this. And this drives all of our appliances to the internet, whether we like it or not. Another mega trend which is driving this is militarization. We're like everything becoming tiny. And the best example of that I could imagine is Deep Blue beating Kasparov, which happened pretty much exactly 20 years ago, in 1997. Now, before this, I, I remember reading about artificial intelligence in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, the typical consensus was that once we have a computer which is going to beat the best chess player on the planet in chess, then we have artificial intelligence. And then it happened for real, 20 years ago, and then we suddenly changed our minds. That, okay, that's not really artificial intelligence, just, just you know, calculating. So we keep moving the, the post, the goalpost, for what do we call artificial intelligence. But the thing, the device that beat Kasparov, Deep Blue, had its own power generator, and it was pretty big. The computing power of Deep Blue was massive, 11 megaflops. The computing power of this is 90 megaflops. So every single one of you have deep blue in your pocket. Actually, you have nine deep blues in your pockets. And they run on batteries. I mean, your phone could beat nine Kasparovs at the same time. This happened in 20 years. Like, that thing turned into this thing. What will it look like in 20, 20 more years? So everything becoming very cheap and very small drives us in a world where everything will be online. And this is happening already. I mean, we scan the internet twice a week. And when I say we scan the internet, I mean we scan the IPv4 address space. We do a port scan on that, which is four to two billion addresses. And we find stuff, stuff like these, people's homes online with no password, <laughs> which means anybody, you can go to this chap's home somewhere in Germany, I guess, and uh, I don't know, turn off the lights, turn on the lights. <laughs> Turn off the alarm, look at the security camera, you know. Don't do this, but you could. This is one of the challenges we face. People misconfiguring their devices, exposing themselves to new risks. Another problem we have is actual vulnerabilities in the devices themselves. And in many cases, this means that IoT devices become the weakest link in your network. For example, there was a vulnerability in, in IoT light bulbs, and this particular vulnerability was leaking the Wi-Fi password. Now imagine your office having these light bulbs in use, and then anybody who walks by can gain access to your internal network because of the IoT light bulbs. And in some cases, these are brought into the office space by employees. IT department doesn't even know they are there. People are bringing IoT <laughs> coffee machines their to their floor cafeterias and plug them into the corporate network. Another problem in, in these vulnerabilities that are in devices themselves are actual technical vulnerabilities, like the one we found from dishwashers um, in spring. In this particular vulnerability is a directory traversal <coughs> vulnerability, which means when you connect to the web server on this dishwasher and you send it this command, you can steal the passwords from it. Let me repeat the beginning of my previous sentence. When you connect to the web server on this dishwasher, this dishwasher has a web server. This is the world where we live in today. It sometimes surprises me why, how everything is going online. 
and our societies runs on computers. Our infrastructure is on computers. We of course got a very good um, reminding of this in May when the WannaCry outbreak was going around the world and for example the healthcare systems here in UK were badly affected. However, if you want to find a bright side of the WannaCry problems with NHS, that's that for once your medical records were strongly encrypted because they were encrypted by a ransomware trojan. Sorry. <laughs> then three weeks after WannaCry, we saw another thing that affected infrastructure all around us, Petya. Petya, which prevented devices from booting. I chose this image of Petya because, um, because normally when you go to an ATM, you're asking money from ATM, and now ATM is asking money from you. Please pay $300. So these ransomware Trojans have become a real problem. And the mega trend behind these, in addition of everything becoming very small and becoming very cheap, is the fact that we have a payment mechanism that the criminals can use, cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, which together with Monero and Zcash is the preferred currency of the online criminals, which of course doesn't mean that they are bad because they're not bad, they're tools. Just like real world cash isn't bad, it's a tool. Yes, criminals like it, but it's not bad in itself. Criminals like real-world cash, online criminals like online uh, cryptocurrencies. And when Petya was going around the world, we saw problems everywhere. For example, this fast food joint couldn't serve you chicken nuggets because of Petya. Because logistics companies around the world were affected by this. And these chicken nuggets, which should have been at the restaurant, were sitting in some container at some pier somewhere because their systems were down because of this. Now, I work for an antivirus company. We make antivirus products. The way we've protected your computers and phones and tablets for decades has been with antivirus software. And this is not going to be the way that we will be protecting our IoT devices. I will promise you, we will never make F-Secure antivirus for toasters, all right? We're not going to do that. And even if we would make it, you couldn't install it because you can't install apps on your toasters or on your washing machines. You, you, we will not be able to solve this problem in the same way we solve the problem on, on, on uh, computers and phones. So if you can't use endpoint security, what can you use? Well, we're building a network level solution, a new device which you will bring into your home and it will create a secure Wi-Fi network just for your IoT devices. And then the devices that you can't protect with endpoint security software, you will connect to this secure Wi-Fi network and they will be protected from the network. We believe this is a completely new security product category. We believe eventually all vendors will have products like this. The other solution would be for all IoT manufacturers to fix their problems. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. The reason why IoT manufacturers don't really invest money into securing their devices is that security is not a selling point for washing machines. When you go buying for a washing machine, you don't ask questions about firewalls and intrusion prevention technologies the washing machine has. <laughs> Instead, you're asking how much is it? Like, what's the price? Price is the number one selling point for home appliances. So home appliance vendors would be stupid to invest money into cybersecurity because that would only make the product more expensive and the features it would create are the features that nobody's asking about. So we're sort of setting ourselves up for failure here. One solution would be to regulate. Let's regulate the IoT makers. We already regulate physical security of home appliances. Why not regulate logical security as well, computer security of them as well. But regulation, as we know, almost always fails. Whatever the final solution is, 
the interim solution will be devices like this. Devices which will create a secure Wi-Fi network and then use that to secure the devices that we can't secure any other way. Thank you very much. <laughs>